everyone, I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. Libya today seems to be trapped in endless conflict between rival militias and rival outside powers, with migrants trapped in slavery and others drowning in the Mediterranean, trying to flee to the European promised land. Prior to the 2011 Arab uprisings, outsiders knew little of Libya, except that it seemed like a bizarre authoritarian country led by the idiosyncratic Gaddafi. We learned of towns during the war, such as Sirte or Zinten, and traced the progress of various militias. An American ambassador was killed, and the Benghazi hearings turned into another American political scandal. One UN envoy after another tried to find solutions, as European and Middle Eastern countries such as France, Italy, Turkey, and the UAE seemed to undermine those efforts. On the left, we rightly blamed the NATO regime change operation for the war and its consequences. Others in the mainstream started to blame the Libyan people themselves for failing to live up to the West's expectations. But history didn't start in 2011. To understand the Libya of today requires going back several decades. That's why I'm joined by Matteo Capasso, a Marie Curie research fellow between the University of Venice and Columbia University. His research examines the impact of US-led imperialism on countries of the global South with a focus on Libya. His most recent article, The Perils of Capitalist Modernity for the Global South, The Case of Libya, was published by the Review of International Political Economy. Matteo, welcome. Thanks for, for having me on your show, Ryan. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Um, so let's just jump right into it and yes. I guess begin at the beginning. <laughs> um, can you start by discussing the nature of Libya's pre-2011 government and explain what was the Jamaharia? I always say this wrong. <laughs> the Jamaharia. Yeah, the Jamaharia. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, well, you know, it's um, it's certainly a long process, as you rightly said in your introduction. Um, Libya uh, basically found the Jamaharia first. What is the Jamaharia? The Jamaharia is uh, is, a, is a is a term coined by uh, Muammar Gaddafi which uh, is one of the group of the revolutionary officers who undertook a coup d'etat in Libya in 1969 and then ruled the country up to 2011. Uh, the Jamairia means the Republic of the Masses. It was established in 1977, so after the coup d'etat um, uh, in 1969. And uh, it was a social formation with a strong third worldist outlook, uh, with uh, state-led uh, capitalist-oriented policies, uh, which were um, uh, which were aiming to improve the lives of uh, the poorer classes, uh, these marginalized groups, uh, and it had a strong outlook uh, towards national liberation movements. In fact, it did support many of them throughout the years. Now, what the Jamairia or the Libyan Revolution was in the early decades, uh, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, was certainly not what Libya looked like uh, in 2011. Why am I saying that? What, because uh, from the, throughout the years, uh, going from the 1980s through the 1990s, uh, a major military and ideological defeat uh, uh, took place. And this ideological and military defeat uh, saw basically the forces of decolonization represented by Libya in this case, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the forces of US-led imperialism. And uh, as the military and ideological defeat took place for the Libyan social formation, this also triggered a massive reconfiguration of the class and, straight and state structure of the regime, which uh, inevitably heightened its internal contradiction. contradiction. So what was a state-led development experience in the early years gradually transformed Metamorphs into a private neo-patrimonial-led uh, social formation. In this process, were, were a class of revolutionary officers turned into a military or merchant, military turned merchant, or what, you know, the, the, lit, uh, the, the third world Marxist would call a comprador uh, mm. state, which ended up supporting, uh, a, a bit quite contradictory, but it did support a certain, ne uh, the, the neoliberal diktat, and so it's a reform of liberalization and privatization. So by the time Libya in 2004 comes out of its international isolation, 
you have it's uh, internally it's divided by this and dominated by this process of class destruction. On the one hand, the technocrats, the reformers, largely guided by Saif al-Islam, one of the sons of, uh, uh, of Muammar Gaddafi. And on the other hand, you have the old guard representing the closer circle of Gaddafi affiliates, what basically was now looked as the anachronistic uh, uh, take of revolutionary politics for many of the Libyan population. Inevitably, what you have also in 2011 is that as uh, more and more the elites start uh, accepting the dictat uh, of uh, the agenda, of the neoliberal uh, agenda, then uh, uh, this defeatism of, of the, the elites and the acceptance of this uh, agenda trickles down to the population under the guise of increasing inequality, to which the government responds to social discontent by becoming increasingly repressive and creating a, more and more alienation. The moment the, though, the moment the protest starts, they are quickly hijacked by the imperialist forces. And what was uh, a popular protest by a certain part of the population becomes an, the entire destruction of the country. Well, that was a uh, very well explained, and I appreciate that you talk about that drift towards neoliberalism uh, on the part of at least some elements of, of the government. But can you talk a little bit also about the impact of sanctions and international isolation on the economy throughout that period and how that also maybe played a role uh, in that drift towards neoliberalism? Totally, yeah. Um, there are two elements, at least in the work that, uh, you know, I've been developing on Libya, two historical key moments that I think come to define uh, this um, military and ideological defeat for the Libyan revolution. And uh, these two moments are the Chadian war and the international sanctions. Now, why the sanctions are important? Well, I mean, you know very well, I guess, that also from your previous host, that since the 1990s uh, and the collapse of the Soviet Union, economic sanctions uh, became an increasingly used and powerful weapon, weapon that could be deployed uh, against countries of the global south that dare to challenge the dominant world order due to the consolidation, consolidation of the financial and political project guided by the US. So as per Libya, you see the sanctions being, uh, you can divide the sanctions into periods. There is uh, unilateral US sanctions being applied uh, heavily as early as nine, the late 1970s, but uh, much more strongly by the Reagan administration in 1981. And then you have the UN multilateral sanctions applied uh, in 1992 after the so-called Lockerbie uh, incident. Mm. So the US unilateral sanctions included an export of, of controls on uh, spare parts and the embargo of aviation spare parts and the embargo of all uh, crude oil products. Now, uh, just to give an idea, uh, considering uh, the, that the US at the time had the monopoly of the, on the aviation industry, the, the control on aviation spare parts really triggered the operational difficulties and uh, for the for the for the, for the Libyan uh, social formation, why? Because first of all, they raised the cost of technological equipments and goods, and uh, you know, procure, procurers could now sell them at inflated price, so adding risk premiums to to those invoices, basically. And uh, the impact on the on the on the nation's Libyan sector was uh, was really strong. Why? Because uh, there were unjustified financial costs. There was a damage to the image and distortion suffered by the Libyan national airline. And also, you know, we should never forget that Libya was coming out of uh, a long period of uh, of Italian colonialism, then British and French occupation. So there was obviously a gap in technological advancement. The US monopoly over the aerospace industry so came to function as a part of the process of unequal exchange of technology, which impeded the health development of a service that was vital to Libya's economy because it required also to bring a lot of uh, foreign workers inside the countries. But uh, I, I'm not going to talk about this, but the sanctions should never be singled out. They were one measures, but they always acted together with other measures taken by the US, whether gunboat diplomacy, bombings, we can go back to that later. But, yeah. but, but by 1994, uh, 
I mean, just to give you an idea, just two years into the sanctions programs, the hallmark of what had been the early decades of the revolution, which was the infrastructural development of Al Fatah, the opening revolution, uh, the construction of hospitals, uh, uh, tenements, uh, uh, the, 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 the possibility to give free education to all the population. Well, by the 1994, many of, the hallmark of the revolution, this infrastructural development was uh, basically collapsed. If you just think about medical staff reductions, that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the sector was strongly dependent on the expertise of foreign doctors. And so was, uh, uh, so were the other, uh, the other, <clears throat> the other sectors, the industrial sectors. So like, for example, as much as 9,000 medical patients had to be treated outside. Then there is this constant repetition by conventional analysis that tell us, oh, but look, Libya was still able to somehow uh, so sell its oil to the European countries, if not uh, to uh, even more than the previous decades. Well, what is completely ignored it's that the economic consequences of this air embargo translated into a depreciation of the currency, so less foreign reserves, thus inflation for the population, an increase of the price of consumer goods that equaled probably 200% above their, their usual level. And inevitably, you know, uh, the geopolitical conditions were risky for investors to go in Libya. Are you going to a country to invest that is under geopolitical threat of war and sanctions? Obviously, you're not going to do that. But at the same time, you are going to exploit the situation because when that country is going to come to you uh, in, uh, and asking for spare parts, you are going to, you know, you're going to provide it with an addi additional cost of 300 or 400 percent. So, you know, sanctions uh, were part of a larger set of warfare and tactics really designed to contain and discipline these uh, material and ideological threats that US-led imperialism was facing. Well said, and that applies, of course, to so many other countries that are still uh, dealing with the consequences of those very same policies. But, you know, I want to turn to a moment to uh, Gaddafi, because, yeah. you know, growing up in the West, Gaddafi was often portrayed as this, like, idiosyncratic, narcissistic, <laughs> crazy person, right, leading this crazy regime, like without institutions, yeah. built completely around his personality. Uh, and as a result, the ideology of the regime and its kind of experiments with uh, these new economic models are ignored or, or ridiculed. Um, yeah. So can you explain, you know, what they were and how they improved the lives of Libyans? Yes. Um, well, unfortunately, as you know, and as you were mentioning, uh, Gaddafi, uh, Gaddafi in Libya is one among many states who has seen, uh, you know, this kind of um, public discourse uh, and unfortunately abundant academic knowledge being produced uh, as a weapon to discredit uh, each and every effort with their own limitations, but still undertaken by those governments that try to regain power uh, to shape their own economy, culture, and society. Libya, Venezuela, we're seeing this with China now, it's mm -hmm. constant. So, um, and, uh, you know, it, what is important, I think, to say about this is that uh, these ideologies or this way of describing are not just uh, misconceptions, but they are also representatives of the class interest that have, you know, to which they are connected. So every time somebody refers to Libya as a rogue state, the terrorist states, these are these terms are also a result of a class struggle. So they cohere with a certain position that has no interest to take seriously the possibility that the global South country can dare to develop an alternative to capitalist-led development. And this is what the Libyan revolutionary government tried to do when it came to power in 1969. Now, from an economic perspective, what is you know is never really recounted when it comes to 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 the Al Fatah revolution, which in 1977 became Al Jamairia, is that the Revolutionary Command Council, as soon as it came to power, expelled the Italian nationals and the Jews, confiscating all their assets. It shut down the Western military bases in the country. Then it proceeded to renegotiate the oil contracts with major Western companies, so which came to be known as the Tripoli Agreements, tipping the balance of power in favor of Libya, an oil-producing country. In other words, Libya spearheaded the possibility of using oil as a political weapon. 
which we'll see this was just temporarily. But, uh, you know, by the idea was for the Revolutionary Command Council to really strive for economic self-sufficiency and restore people's rights over national resources. So uh, this is why in 1977, the role of the Libyan government as a guarantor and distributor of the country's economy was consolidated with the, uh, with the establishment of the Jamairia. And bold reforms were implemented. We're talking about the elimination of private property and the idea of employment itself, of the wage. Uh, there was an introduction of a program of land reform in 1978, and caps were put on real estate property ownership, basically abolishing the practice of rent. There was this famous policy created called uh, uh, al bayt Lisakini, the house is for those who live in it, so there was no possibility to profit through rent. In 1986, Private land ownership was abolished altogether. The private retailers were closed throughout the country. And the government created also an extensive subsidies program uh, covering basic foods like uh, flour, uh, rice, sugar, and also tried to cover electronic equipment, you know. But uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, by, uh, not the thing is that by the early 1980s, uh, the government had accomplished many of its promises. Now. You know, we have to think that, uh, um, uh, just to give you an idea with some of the figures, you know, that it, they are available actually on, uh, on, uh, on uh, imperialist, uh, you know, institutions like the National Monetary Fund or the World Bank. The life expectancy of Libyans increased from 55 to 64 years over the course of 11 years. The average intake of calories per day was the highest among the members of the OPEC. The rate of infant mortality declined massively. Uh, the government transformed slums and uh, unhealthy uh, <clears throat> dwellings into tenements, in, in, launched a wide range of infra infrastructural projects, also came up with the idea of an artificial river to provide water for the population and provided free health care and education. Now, this is not a glorification, obviously, of uh, of the of the of the revolution of the Libyan revolution, but it's uh, really an historical fact that these policies translated into a solid popular consensus, consensus and widespread support for a model of political and economic development that challenged the idea of market-oriented world political system under U.S. hegemony. Something that it seems so impossible nowadays. But this is the way we're talking about the era of decolonization. And this is why I think it's important to trace back and really understand that, uh, you know, there were limitations, but they were really trying to provide an alternative to capitalist and Western development. So why do you think it's so necessary to understand Libya, Libya through this decades long process of imperialist aggression in order to understand the post 2011 Libya? Uh, you know, uh, let me give you an example from my from my actual work. When I started approaching uh, and and uh, dealing with the issue of war in the Arab region and specifically in Libya, I was liaising a lot with think tank analysts, policymakers, and so on. Well, you know, the the, the immediate realization what I un it immediately understood was that much like the public discourse and academic literature, they all accepted this idea about Libya, of how Libya reached this stage today. So basically, there were three main hypotheses, which were a country has never developed modern state structures, you know, since the colonial uh, Italian period, you know, you have this, uh, the, and, and this leads to the second uh, uh, assumption, which is uh, 1969 brought uh, the instauration of an authoritarian regime that remained in power until 2011 by manipulating the tribes, the oil revenues, and never embracing or rejecting the liberal international order. So when you reach to 2011, the Gaddafi basically brought on himself the NATO-led intervention, which was helpful to host him, but it lacked a plan for the day after. And I am sure, that, Rania, you can connect in the sense with this type of hypothesis when we look at a, a situation like Syria. You know, just change the tribal divisions with sectarian divisions. But what we are yeah. they are basi basically telling us uncritically is that Libya's problems are of a fundamentally internal nature. Right. Something is missing here. 
Where is the role of US led imperialism? Don't we live under capitalism? Where is the global order in all this? And you see, what I started to realize more and more is that what at the, at the start was just an analytical exercise is that uh, the, the conceptual assumptions that we have over reality will come to determine the material ways, the policies devised to eventually think of a solution to the issues that we are faced with. Right. So one thing is, you know, to block migrants and to put more boats and, uh, you know, and to send weapons. Another one is to start realizing, oh, maybe our system of economic production has something to do with this. We have responsibilities. So this is why the need to really start uh, tracing this back to the 1969 and to the era of decolonization. And in that sense, you know, you kind of um, you were referring earlier to the importance of oil. And so I'm curious, you know, why did the Libyan state fail to transform the working class into a productive sector and fail to end dependency on oil? Um, and I'm not trying to be harsh here because you do mention a lot of important things that were done. But, you know, you got to look back no, no, at it with a critical eye. <laughs> Absolutely, you're right. Because uh, uh, if uh, if we were, to, if I was to define the Libyan uh, development experience, I would probably use the word state-led capitalism. Libya, uh, at least uh, uh, in the early decades, uh, throughout the 70s and the 80s, it never never became a socialist state because the government struggled to make people take full control over the means of production. So. Uh, the the state capitalist class which considerably overlapped with the group of army officers who had carried out this 1969 coup d'etat which just for those who are listening to us it was called the operation was called jerusalem in uh, in uh, in honor in honor of the palestinian cause uh, so the state capitalist class took control of the national resources it's especially banks and oil, and then allocated them to economic reform uh, reforms in support of political goals, namely the national and in the end time period of struggle. And this is important to understand because uh, the, the rationale was uh, we cannot have national independence without a radical change of the international order. So the two went together. It's not that, you know, um, one cannot understand why was uh, the Libyan government providing arms to the Palestinians or the IRA and uh, I was not thinking about reforms at home. These two processes took place at the same time. Now it encountered, inevitably it encountered many problems, like, for example, the agricultural and industrial sector were uh, never thrived because they were largely dependent on foreign labor because nationals traditionally working in the agricultural sector were obviously uh, more attracted by higher paid part-time jobs provided by the government. To address the question of, uh, of labor, of foreign labor, the government only in 1984, which is uh, what, almost 20 years since the 1969, started to coordinate the, the academic university system with the labor market. In other words, gearing degrees towards the needs and resources of Libyan society. The revolution ultimately failed to transform the working class into a productive force for the economy. And also there was a problem to, um, with, uh, with the effective effectiveness of uh, the structure of representation, which were increasingly centralized by the revolutionary committees who sought to inherit, and we will see this more and more in the 90s and 2000s, the prerogatives, the privileges of the old bourgeois order. Now, I am glad you had Torquil Lawson in, uh, in your show because this is going to allow me to say what? That uh, in the, when we are analyzing this dialectically, this uh, is certainly an important contradiction, but it's secondary considered to the struggle against imperialism. Why? Because uh, in the mid 1980s, and this is where the oil dependence is so important to understand, Libya lost, like many other uh, oil producing states, the capacity to affect oil prices. Why? Because in the 1980s, the US spearheaded the financialization of oil. Mm. Meaning, oil contracts started to be traded as futurities on the stock market. And this maneuver was uh, consolidated US imperialism, inevitably, also vis a vis the Soviet Union at the time. Mm. 
And on top of that, in 1985, Saudi Arabia, which was most likely acting in coordination with the US, decided to break with OPEC, increasing fourfold its production. And this triggered a collapse of the oil prices by approximately the same amount in real terms. So what we're seeing is basically that uh, by 1987, Gaddafi announces the first wave of economic liberalization, the Infita. So if we proceed dialectically, you know, what I want to say is that basically oil dependency was certainly a problem and affected the capacity of the government. But we should never forget that each of these attempts took place under the primary contradiction where the U.S. and its allies were able not only to control, to control the financial system, but to weaponize it through the dollar and uh, inevitably then unleash uh, a hybrid war against Libya. Well, Dom, I'm actually meant you, glad you mentioned the issue of hybrid war because I wanted to ask you to maybe elaborate on that a bit. a bit. I mean, you've talked about these different mechanisms and measures that the U.S. put into place, or I should say the global imperialist order put in place to like discipline Libya. Um, so when you say hybrid war, can you explain what you mean? Yeah, uh, when, I met, when I refer to the hybrid war, I mean uh, to this, uh, I refer to this set of uh, conventional and conventional and non-conventional measures uh, using state and non-state groups uh, to undermine uh, the ambitions uh, and, uh, and the achievements uh, of a revolutionary global South state. It's a term that is also used by the Three Continental Institute, for example, report when uh, titled a hybrid war against Venezuela. So uh, to, uh, to fully understand the hybrid war and to move, and before we move to, the, to, to talk about the measures, I think it would be interesting to discuss, and this is part of the project that I am dealing with now uh, by looking at the, at the archives and declassified documents from the CIA, the US State Department, the NSA. It is interesting to establish the motives that led to this uh, hybrid war. Why? Because uh, the moment you clarify what were the motives that led to this hybrid war, you don't just understand that the U.S. has maintained a military and economic project in the war, and specifically in the Arab region of which Libya is part. But when Libya dared to challenge such project, the forces of imperialism came in and started using uh, cons military conspiracies, military bombings, economic warfare, and so forth and so on. And what you see when you're looking at these documents is that uh, three main pillars struck you immediately. First, what we already talked about, which is uh, national autonomy over economic policy. Uh, that was something that could not even be conceivable for a country of the global south. Then you have anti-colonial solidarity. And this is where, you know, I am just, uh, I was shocked to see the amount of uh, which I probably, I, I even underestimated the amount of Libyan government sponsor and support for national liberation movements all, all over the world, with a specific focus on the Zionist, against the Zionist entity. And this is, I think, something that uh, generations to come should really remember, because uh, it's uh, the amount of support that Libya provided to different Palestinian factions to fight the Zionist entity is really like uh, something that should be studied and investigated much more. And finally, the last point was proximity to the Soviet Union, you know, and uh, despite the numerous, uh, you know, probably you could say disagreement, one of them being actually the fight against the Zionist entity, the US perceived that Libya and the Soviet Union were somehow colluding in many theaters, including Oman, Ethiopia, Western Sahara, Angola. So by the early uh, by the 70s, immediately, you know, all this, uh, by the late 70s, we could say, the US starts uh, unleashing this hybrid war on, uh, on Libya. And think about the first measure, the, the first time that the US was put, that Libya was put on the US uh, list of uh, state sponsoring of terrorism is 1979 precisely when Libya rejects the Camp David Treaty between Egypt and Israel. And uh, this will continue because, you know, it will include uh, the, the training of a contra group in Chad of a military, of, of part of the Libyan military was trained by the US in Chad and then used uh, to try uh, uh, an attempt coup d'etat in Libya. 
the, the sanctions we already talked about, the support of jihadi groups across time from the National Front of Salvation of Libya to the Libyan uh, uh, fighting force, Islamic uh, fighting force. And, uh, you know, we can go on and on in the type of measures that the U.S. has taken against Libya. We'll do a whole episode. We'd have to do a whole episode just on that to actually go through it all. But no, I appreciate that. I'm. I want to turn to the issue of the Chad, the civil war in Chad in 1973, and the proxy war that took place because it sounds a bit like the proxy war taking place in Libya today with many of the same players, even. And you claim that the loss in the Chad war and then the 1992 sanctions were two key historical moments because they culminated in this massive military ideological defeat for the Libyan revolution. So can you explain the consequences like liberalization and the flow of Libyan investments outside to uh, Western countries? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the war, okay, the war was, uh, was a turning point, you know, in terms of uh, military and ideological defeat because Libya entered the war as early as 1973 and initially was able to make some advances. I mean, now, uh, whether or not we could agree on the strategic choice of the Libyan government to intervene and occupy an area of Chad, that's another story. But what we can see is that there was a rationale to this, uh, to, uh, to, this, uh, um, uh, to this military involvement in Chad. Why? Because immediately Libya supported the anti-French group, the Front de Liberation Nationale du Chad, and occupied the Azusu Street. Now, the whole rationale was that basically Libya rejected the, 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 colonial, the, the colonial border formation and said that this area belongs to us because it's part of the heritage of the Senusia Brotherhood, which was uh, the brotherhood from which the king, uh, the, the monarchy, actually was in, uh, had been established uh, back in 1951. In any case, by 1987, with the famous Toyota War, which is uh, called so because uh, um, uh, Toyota pickup trucks uh, were given to the Chadian forces sponsored by France, the United States, Israel, and Saudi Arabia, these pickup trucks were used to defeat and push back the Libyan army. And so, while Chad turned into, I mean, a military debacle, the debacle by the end of the 1980s. Then you have the Soviet Union that collapses. And this is where we enter, as we said before, the infamous UN sanctions decade. So the military defeat, coupled with the burden of international sanctions, br brings about a geopolitical uncertainty around Libya. And cracks within the elite start to appear. Why? Because there is a, an ideological uh, defeatism that starts to to, to, uh, to leak that inevitably has to do also with, uh, with the intertemporal uh, preferences of investors. Basically, everybody starts to say, why do we continue to challenge imperialism here? We are isolated. We, are, uh, we have lost a war and there was no reason uh, and we are tired to fight this war. So what you see is that uh, when the government announces under the pressure of the elites to open up the private sector, many members of the security apparatus, whether from the military, the police, or the intelligence, starts in, start investing uh, abroad the wealth that they had mm. accumulated in the previous decade. And this is where, you know, you see the changes. Why? Because uh, if the initial launch of these egalitarian policies uh, had imposed the strict legal limits on uh, uh, foreign dollarized capital investments, uh, this wave of liberalization opens up the gates of investments. Libyan investments flows outside to Western countries uh, and instead of being invested at the national level. And this process of shifting alliances, you know, it's really something that uh, it's not unique to Libya because uh, it's, uh, it's the moment where uh, an era I very much uh, um, suggest the reading of the work of, uh, of Ali Kadri because it really describes the emergence of uh, this comprador class. So you have these military revolutionaries that are now turning merchants. It's not war. It's a, it, it looks anachronistic to even think that we can fight the Zionist entity, which should just try to reconcile with the West and think about ourselves. So what happens is that, uh, you know, we have seen this switch in all, the, in the, in, in all these Arab republics, such as Egypt, Iraq, or Syria, whereas that 
had taken place after 1973 war, in this case, what we have is that the Chadian war, I think it's crucial to understand the changes in, uh, within the Libyan government. And uh, what you have is that uh, uh, the, the Comprador class now starts to establish uh, a relationship uh, to the country and the natural resources that uh, is, uh, is, rash, is uh, highly uh, rentier. Basically, they try to extract from the country for their own private uh, in uh, <clears throat> for, on the, for their own private interest this is what corruption is all about at the end which is the, you know the transfer of public wealth into the into private property and that keeps just uh, uh, rising and rising during this period in libya you know during my interviews i i remember so much like uh, the resentment that the that many of libyans had towards the so called uh, fat cats that they had uh, enrich themselves throughout the period of the international sanctions. At the same time, you have the working class population that are facing the steady rise of, in of inflation. They are trying to get around the sanctions through smuggling and black markets, but also to the need of finding uh, secondary jobs. And that's where the rise of corruption mm -hmm. couples with uh, increasing alienation towards the government because and and people start wondering why are we doing this why are we fighting the west anymore yeah and, and this is where the defeat lies yeah you know I mean, what you're saying actually reminds me a lot of uh syria right now in fact that what the sanctions have done to syria i mean any any aspect of the sort of bathist regime that had like a social welfare system to it has mostly disappeared and now it's just you know a lot of um people making a lot of money off of the black markets that yeah. you know are a result of sanctions and this really like elite circle of sort of mafia bosses. It's it's it, the level of destruction it causes um, is is so similar like across countries. But you know you you also write that a framework upholding capitalist modernity emerged as an alternative to socioeconomic inequalities and failing infrastructural development. Can you explain what you mean by that? Basically, uh, we are uh, it, it, temporally, I would say historically, we are during this period. What we are seeing is that uh, uh, ideologically, the, the, there is a contradiction that takes place in Libya during this time. So uh, the country is under imperialist assault. So uh, there is a, a, an ideological defeatism uh, among the elites, which, uh, you know, uh, trickles down to the population as well. So what happens is that... Uh, the solution to failing infrastructural development and rising inflation and socioeconomic inequalities. So basically, Libya's further integration into capitalism mm -hmm. becomes what? Capitalism itself. And why does, you know, how does that happen? It happens because. Uh, uh, as we had seen, uh, for example, uh, in the Soviet Union, you know, the idea was uh, uh, people started wanting jeans, started wanting uh, consumerist mm -hmm. goods, because the idea was that, uh, you know, consumer fantasies, this is what Western analysts keep telling us, conventional ones at least, function as forms of popular resistance. Leather jackets, uh, jeans, you know, we are done with this authoritarianism you know, we want the lifestyle of the West. But there is a problem here. Which one is it? It's the fact that if we, this type of imaginaries, this type of solution, forget to tell us that in this global South context, this global South social formation operate under a wider geopolitical structure, which is US-led imperialism. So, this fantasies and this idea of upholding capitalist modernity, which uh, f was further cemented in the, in the dream of Dubai, were symptomatic of, uh, they were not forms of resistance, they were symptomatic of a wider reconfiguration of the working class, of the ruling class, sorry, which had abandoned a vision, another vision of the future. So being defeated, you know, the population simply started wanting what the elites were pursuing. And, and this is where, you know, basically they wanted capitalism. That's what they started wanting. 
And Dubai really captures perfectly that kind of contradiction itself. Indeed, across the region, <laughs> the Dubai dream, as, as, as you've referred to it. Um, and of course, you, you talk about how this was like a catalyst for 2011, and I do want to get to that. Um, but, you know, I wanted you to also touch on the issue of why did Libyans who were left out of the country's wealth gravitate either to Western patterns of consumption and values, which you just described, but on the other hand, others gravitated towards religious extremism? Was it yeah. for similar reasons? Yes and no. I mean, uh, uh, in the sense that uh, um, with the increase of social economic inequalities and the rise of corruption, and once again, I have to say this because otherwise, you know, we think that capitalism is not corrupted, which whereas I think is the most corrupted system of economic right. uh, production. Corruption is the transfer of public wealth into private property. So mm -hmm. once corruption rises, social economic inequalities also rise. And that's where social discontent becomes a reality. And this is where we need to start understanding the different layers of the metamorphosis of the Libyan formation. Why? Because uh, by the 19, in the 1990s uh, is a period marked by internet, uh, the multilateral UN sanctions, uh, and also by the emergence of several opposition movements in Libya, some coming from the military and others foreign sponsored. So in 1993, for example, you have a group of military officers, mostly coming from a tribe which was very close to the regime, the Warfalla, which attempted a coup d'etat, but it was uns unsuccessful. This coup d'etat is then followed by a major confrontation in the eastern part of the region between the government and the West-sponsored uh, Libyan Islamic uh, fighting force, Al-Jama' al-Islamiyya al-Muqatila. Uh, this, uh, uh, this threat is very important. Why? Because uh, first and foremost, it involved the complicity of two British uh, secret uh, intelligence agencies, the MI6 the MI and MI5. Uh, the group consisted mainly of the so-called Libyan Afghans, so Islamist jihadi, jihadi fighters who had fled Libya in the 1980s, joined the Mujahideen in Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. Then they decide to come back to Libya to mount a resist, an armed resistance against the regime with the firm goal to eliminate the Libyan leadership. Now, it's interesting because, uh, and I visited the city of Manchester to do some interviews, you know, and, and I, it was really difficult to talk to anybody because uh, the same groups, which initially were funded to overthrow Gaddafi, then they were actually, uh, the leaders of this group were actually given, delivered to Gaddafi when the, 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 Li the Libyan government and the West decided to, to improve their relationship. And then back in 2011, the same leaders come to liberate Tripoli from the authoritarian regime. Thanks again to, uh, to the support of the UK and- uh, The circle the of leaders. imperialism. <laughs> the circle of imperialism. <laughs> That's right, absolutely, yeah. Well, it's, it's good you mentioned Manchester, too, because I remember back in 2017, there was actually an attack in Manchester by yes. a guy who had fought in the anti-Gaddafi uprising in Libya and came from a family where his father had been a former anti-Gaddafi Islamist fighter that had been given safe haven in the UK. So it really is like a circle of just... It uh, is. It is, absolutely. It, it, no, you are completely right, you know, because what's happening now is that with the rereading, the revisionist history that it's taking place, you see popping up publications or uh, analysis that under the question of agency, they are basically turning uh, a foreign-sponsored Islamist group as, uh, as a form of agency against the dictatorial regime. Right. And, uh, I, I mean, I don't know, it's, uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. you know... <laughs> So in any case, Afghanistan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yes. No, but I mean, what I was basically uh, re-answering re to your question about, uh, uh, you know, gravitating on consumerism and then on is on uh, on Islamist sponsored uh, uh, political forces, and that's you know, this is what it comes from. Now, I'm not trying to say obviously that Islam is an exogenous factor to the region. On the contrary, it has always been present. You know, we know that. But uh, turning Islam and particularly a fundamentalist vision into such a powerful political force was a project spearheaded by the West. And we have seen that they have never had problems to, to empower the most radical and fundamentalist uh, groups. I mean, we're seeing this right now in Ukraine as well. So, I mean, this is where really you can see, you know, the rise of political Islam in the region that spills over also into Libya.
Exactly. Exactly. I, I also wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned this like very, you mentioned tribal groups. Why was there a resurgence of tribal groups and what was the regime's role in this? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, when we talk about tribes, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we perfectly know that conventional pundits love to refer to tribalism. It's, it's kind of somewhat right. mysterious, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, social uh, factor playing uh, behind the curtains in Libya. Again, if from an from a, an is from a from a political economy perspective, this is at least the way I approach it, and I think it makes sense uh, to do so. Uh, it allows to understand because it allows us to understand what that uh, the increasing reliance or revival by the government in on uh, neo patrimonial connections, uh, informal connections, uh, in, including tribal mechanism, had to do with uh, the rising socio economic inequalities. Uh, the increasing social discontent and so the government tries to control now the population a little bit more through the use of these uh, neo patrimonial connections including uh, tribalism so tribalism uh, be, w libya essentially is uh, how do you say tribal mechanism are not uh, an essence of libyan society uh, but uh, they constitute uh, a configuration of social relations which was intimately connected to the larger culture of uh, wasta again corruption favors bribes that characterized libya particularly us from the 1990s uh, onwards so what you see is that uh, uh, the revival uh, of uh, tribalism uh, took place also because the government was trying uh, to uh, to reorganize society in order to control it and this is uh, clearly visible, for example, by the fact that all Qaddafi's offspring, all his sons, occupied critical position at the financial, political and military levels. That is absolutely true. But at the same time, we shouldn't forget that this kind of predatory behavior, this corrupt behavior, started from the international sanctions itself, when, where you see numerous foreign companies coming and profiting from the sanctions by selling anything at uh, 300 times uh, the price higher than the market one so it's really you see that libya integrates into the capitalist economy more and more abandoning terrorism and and this is where you know social economic inequalities start to appear more and more mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and of course you know when we talk about what they call a lot of what they call terrorism and a lot of the reason libya was so isolated has so much to do with this alternative system but also of course gaddafi's like support for national liberation struggles in the Middle East and Africa, and it really can't be understated how much Libyan support there was across the region uh, throughout that time period. But of course, the relationship between Gaddafi with the West changed over the years from that isolation to improved ties post-2003 to what could be called you know, close collaboration with countries like France and Italy, and then they still turned on him. Um, which is interesting, right? It wasn't enough. So can you maybe summarize a little bit of that history, at least briefly? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, um, uh, on the on the on the support to national liberation, you know, I can uh, if uh, I can quote because I have it with me this uh, uh, this uh, memo from the uh, from the CIA from 1975 that says Libyan government adopted a policy of subvers subversive activity, coup plotting, and support for, unquote, national liberation movements in Latin America, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, as well as support for foreign terrorist organizations in Western Europe. Now, the, this is the first period. Libya is very active, is providing arm, armed uh, financing, armed struggle all over the world. And the idea is not that uh, all these groups uh, were all ideologically aligned. On the contrary, the Libyan government perceived them as destabilizing US-led imperialism everywhere in the world. So you, you had very different groups being funded. The second period, which is uh, after the, which is uh, linked to the necessities of the Libyan government to overcome the international isolation, has to do instead with the project of African unity. And this is where we see uh, Gaddafi himself admitting that uh, now the conflict is between us and imperialism, but uh, in the globalization is key. America wants uh, an American globalization. We want a globalization that is an international one. And so you see all this kind of uh, diplomatic expansion and economic investments towards the African continent, including those that were revealed by 
the WikiLeaks email of uh, by WikiLeaks uh, through, the, through the account of Hillary Clinton telling us that Libya intended to undertake the launch of important monetary changes for the African continent. Or we can go back to that. In any case, and what we see is also that uh, this reconfiguration within, the, within uh, the class structure of the regime had a lot to do with the West, inevitably. And so by 9-11, with the US invasion of Afghanistan and then Iraq, in 2003, Gaddafi decides to publicly announce that he's going to abandon its weapons of mass destruction, although the, 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 the negotiation had been going for long. And uh, the U.S. follows all the other European states, dropping all the economic sanctions and re-engaging officially within, with, the, with the Jamairia. At the same time, the government, what does it do? It, uh, it uh, exploits this situation and decides to cooperate in a program of extraordinary rendition, mm -hmm. the rendition program with the U.S. and the U.K. And that's, we, we go back to what we were mentioning before, that those uh, same Islamist forces that had been sponsored by the West are now delivered to the Libyan government right. as part of this redemption program. In 2008, also, the, the Italian government officially apologizes to the Libyan people for the atro atrocity committed during its uh, colonial rule. 2009, Gaddafi goes to, to Italy and, met, and meets uh, uh, Silvio Berlusconi. They sign an agreement for, as a form of historical reconciliation between the two countries. But again, this, uh, this is a time of heightening contradictions because if on the one hand there is uh, reconciliation with the West, spearheaded a lot by Saif al-Islam, the son of Gaddafi, because uh, he writes uh, articles on Middle East policy saying uh, we are now ready to transform decades of mutual antagonism into genuine friendship with the US. He brings uh, international research agency to turn to Libya into the Dubai of the North Africa. On the other hand, we have these projects of uh, financial and regional cooperation that Libya is trying to establish with the African continent. And in 2011, you know, it's key because uh, France feels sidelined uh, by Libya. And that's where you see Italy not really comfortable to intervene in the, in, uh, uh, in the war or in the invasion of, the, of, of Libya, whereas France and the UK, they just jump on it. So. Uh, you know, and it's also interesting, actually, that this is something that uh, it's never mentioned, but it. actually uh, the Libyan government asked the UK and France and the US uh, in 2000, I think in 2010 or 2008, to sign a letter where they uh, committed not to intervene in the national sovereignty of the country. Wow, they really stood by that, huh? <laughs> I mean, it's no, it's incredible because um, it's it's just the destruction of Libya was so calculated and extreme. But you know, I wanna I wanna zoom out from Libya. I wanna go back to Libya, but I also just wanna zoom out for a moment because I think you have a really good analysis on this, and that's the question of you know, can you maybe discuss the centrality of war and militarism in the project of U.S. led imperialism? Because there's such an important connection between these wars and this process of domination and capital accumulation. Yeah, no, you're right, uh, Rania. And I mean, when we look at uh, the Arab region, unfortunately, uh, these connections, uh, sooner or later, they need to be made. I mean, uh, it's not just uh, Libya, it's Syria, it's Iraq, uh, it's Yemen, uh, it's Iran under sanctions, uh, it's everywhere. So why is this important? Well, we know that... Uh, uh, um, Rosa Luxemburg, for example, was uh, one of the first uh, thinkers to, to argue that military ventures abroad are necessary to maintain the expansion of imperialism. So mm -hmm. you go, you invade the country, and uh, there is usually this idea, okay, we, uh, oh, it's good, it's profitable, because we are going to reconstruct the country afterwards. So we, we put a puppet government, and then, you know, we get all the contracts to reconstruct. That would make sense. But if we look at the outcome of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, what is it, 17 years of war? No, 19 years like of war. Almost 20, yeah. So almost 20 years of war. Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen. Then this is where I think war and militarism are no longer a means to an end. I mean, the construction of a, of a free market society, if you want. But militarism 
creates the present reality and sustain and that is sustained by endless war. So what basically I'm trying to say is that war per se becomes a sphere of production, accumulation and investment. Re war sustains war through securitization, border surveillance, arms sales, private and military companies, and this creation of closed logistical spaces where development agencies, aid workers, mercenaries are all coming in. I mean, ultimately, war is not, uh, that's what it's becoming uh, more and more important to understand with the changes uh, uh, within US led imperialism, which is war is a full economic cycle. One that is not uh, irrational, because when we think of violence, we get emotional, we get sentimental, but uh, war can be very rational for capital because it rebalances the class struggle always in favor of capital. Now, what does that mean? It means that uh, when we think of wars, we immediately make the connections, as I was saying, with concrete industries, the oil, the military. But these are only part of the equation. Why? Because uh, uh, the tendency is to, uh, is to turn abstract concepts into things. And because we can, you know, we can touch them, we can understand them. But it's the ontological relation that is really, you know, problematic, uh, that it, it should be really worrying in the sense that uh, the creation of value by capital is done also by rebalancing uh, the, the, social, the social sphere, meaning what? That uh, the capital can take us to the complete destruction of developing countries, if not the entire planet, if that is what is needed to sustain itself. Because uh, wars rebalance, uh, uh, in, in this way, wars rebalance the class, the class struggle in favor of capital through the direct annihilation of people. You kill people, or in even better, let people kill each other. Wars reduce their longevity in relation to their historically determined levels. Wars cheapen their lives of workers. Don't just think about the death. Uh, people dying at wars. Also, let's think about those, the fate of those who try to escape wars. So by destroying both man and nature, these wars weaken the sovereignty of, of countries. They make them weak, fragmented. There is no more an institutional support that is, is capable of mediating the interest of the working classes vis-a-vis -vis capital. So the global south position weakens and war creates the space necessary for capital, uh, you know, for, for US-led imperialist forces to lay the historical foundations for actors to act upon. So it's not just a question of profit. It's, it's a, an entire mode of social reproduction that guarantees profits, but uh, weakens labor to mediate with, uh, in, in, in its capacity to mediate uh, with, uh, with capital. And I believe this is, I have to say this, but uh, anybody who entertains the possibility that NATO can act as a progressive mm. force, it is either paid by an intelligence agency or it is someone who's acting to safeguard its own class privileges, because uh, which are yeah. tied to imperialism. A hundred percent. No, that was, I mean, that's so important what you just said and also just reveals just the level of dystopia in the system that we live under, uh, just given like the level of death and just gruesome atrocities that are inflicted on people to maintain this system. Uh, but I guess to move back to Libya now, and I promise to connect what we just talked about to it, but let me start with this. Why yeah. did so many militias emerge in Libya? Well, because uh, clearly it wasn't uh, uh, a unified uprising in Libya. That's uh, what you had where, uh, you know, as, uh, popular protest in uh, certain parts uh, of Libya. Uh, there was social discontent, absolutely, from particularly among the youth. But what you have after is, uh, you know, the increasingly pouring uh, of weapons by Western countries mostly and their regional allies, Qatar, UAE, Saudi Arabia, even Sudan. And the idea is uh, let's arm any group who has the goal to overthrow the leadership. What's gonna happen after that, again, it was in nobody's interest because it's not in the interest of capital to, you know, to, to, to basically try to rationalize and say, again, let's put uh, somebody, let's put a puppet government, somebody we can control. The idea at that point is that war feeds war. Uh, 
Yeah. And this is where we see all this, uh, you know, we want to talk about corruption under uh, the Jamairia in the last uh, decades. That's fine. We should talk about corruption. But let's look at the level of corruption that is now taking place in the country. And I'm sure you had this beautiful conversation with Mustafa Fetouri on your show where, mm -hmm. you know, it describes all this. You know, it's uh, they control everything and every single non-violent market from even poultry and eggs has to go through a power of a certain militias, meaning through the weapons provided by one of their foreign patrons. Right. And, and this is how you dismantle the social texture of a country. We saw it happen in Syria too. And it's funny too, because it's the way you talked about, like the way that tribalism's talked about and all these other issues re revolving around Libya are talked about as unique to Libya. The idea of militias, I mean, this I think would happen in most places where the conditions that were imposed on Libya are imposed. I mean, I think tomorrow in the area of the US where I grew up in Virginia, you could see the emergence of militias Absolutely. in various neighborhoods if you had a similar set of circumstances. Absolutely. Like you're talking Absolutely. About. Um, and so I guess to bring it back to what we were talking about, how does US-led imperialism underlie the ongoing war and militarism which contributed to the destruction of Libya? And how does or how is Libya's trajectory linked to forces at the core of US-led imperialism? Well, because uh, uh, as uh, our, uh, you know, as one of the comrades that I think uh, is has uh, been also on your show with Jay Prashad has always said, you know, what we're seeing is uh, is the, 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 a battle that goes back to the 60s and uh, 50s. It's the forces of decolonization on the one hand and the forces of imperialism on the other hand. When we look at Libya, we are looking at the revolution that uh, did not act uh, alone. It was part of a larger movement at the time that saw the rise of Arab socialism, uh, the, the installation of many revolutions, and also the presence of a counterbalance to the, to, to, to the US, which was the Soviet Union. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, the, the sanctions decade, the US going fully dragged on its neo, neoliberal policies, you know, basically there is a uh, this vision, this way of seeing the world that coming from the global south are gradually, many of them at least, are gradually defeated. And uh, we need to understand the relationship, the legacy that imperialism has on Libya. Because as I said at the start, you know, it's if we continue to if we continue to proceed by saying, oh look, all these militias, all these armed groups are, uh, they mirror, they simply reflect the legacy of Gaddafi, well, then, you know, we're not going to get out of, of anywhere. I mean, I'm, I, I'm sure maybe you might agree with the fact that the situation worldwide is quite gloomy. But uh, this is where, you know, we need to understand how imperialism underlies uh, the, the, the fragmentation, the destruction of Libya. Because Libya has been, you know, first, in slowly integrated into the global circuits of capital with an hybrid war through the 90s. And this latest war of aggression has literally inserted Libya into a changing phase of imperialism. Because as much as Libya has changed from the 70s, imperialism has also changed. And this is where we see that uh, we're seeing uh, the bully in, uh, in decline and is trying to do everything to hold on its power. And how is he, how is he doing this? by creating all this amount of wars all over the world. And, uh, and this is a way to maintain the primacy of, of capital, but at the same time, it's so destructive that uh, it's scary. It is, it's terrifying. It really is. And, you know, I get to moving to now the present day, uh, why is it that the conflict in Libya persists and defies what seems like all attempts to halt it? Well, you know, it's, uh, yeah, we go, I mean, obviously we go back to the assumptions that are given to the conflict, you know, uh, which is, uh, this is uh, a Libya, this is Libya's problem. But, uh, you know, you just need to look at the figure, literally, to understand the, the cycle of, uh, of imperial violence and profitability. So on the one hand, you have a United Nation in Libya. United Nations mission in Libya was trying to talk about peace, arms embargo, and so on and so forth. But then you look at the U.S. arms sales to the to the Middle East, 
that in 2019, they increased uh, 118% compared to the previous years. Take Italy, has managed to sell a total of 1 billion.3 armaments to, to, to the countries uh, in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. Then you have the refugee problems. And this is where, you know, this self-fulfilling cycle is really striking because the war industry profits from both sides of the tragedy. First, you fuel, you fuel conflict in the region. Then you start providing the infrastructure and technologies to stop refugees from coming to Europe. So you have uh, top European arms sellers and not, so Riken, uh, Finmeccanica, Airbus, which are the, the, the same beneficiaries of this tragedy, of this destruction. You uh, French military operation in the Sahel since the, the destruction of Libya have increased. Uh, Germany and the US are, are building a, a wall uh, between Libya and Tunisia for security reasons. The EU is installing a digital surveillance uh, system in the, on the coast of Tunisia. And AFRICOM, who, who, which Kada, who's, uh, whose base is Gaddafi opposed to be based in Africa, finally has relocated in Africa because it used to be in Frankfurt, Germany. Hmm. I mean, basically, it's, uh, you are seeing uh, why is the conflict not reaching an end? Yes, there are numerous... Uh, internal conditions and contradictions that require uh, that require careful analysis that require uh, a careful handling and policies but again and again what you're seeing when you're reading all these policies is that we just don't want to talk about the elephant in the room nobody wants to question the current economic model yeah yeah and it's as simple yeah. as that. <laughs> um, and I do, I appreciate your time. And I, I promise just a couple more questions. Um, but I wanted to ask you about, you know, there are so many myths about the Arab Spring, about the first protests oh, yeah. and, you know, regime responses. So can you briefly summarize how things got started in Libya? Like, why did the uprising take place when it did? Was it was it actually peaceful at first? Yeah. Do you think there really was a threat of the regime committing massacres in Benghazi? Uh, so, fun questions. Uh, no, yeah, fun questions because, you know, you, uh, I know you are very well versed in what happened in Syria and uh, uh, fabrication, unfortunately, it's uh, the information war, let's put it in yeah. this way, is part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no justification for what NATO has done to Libya in 2011. I mean, even if I found Libyans themselves justifying it, it's, uh, it, it, you know, we go back to this uh, idea that uh, you uphold capitalist modernity as a way to, you know, to improve your condition. But this is uh, a self-defeating. So 2011 was a war of aggression. The grounds were ripe and they were exploited because there were increasing internal contradictions, which we, you know, we have discussed from progressive revolution to compador state. But I'm saying this to reply to your question over the massacre, for example. You know, the protest starts in, uh, in, on the 17th of February, which is this anniversary for uh, the, the martyrs of... Uh, of the families that had disappeared in, in a Libyan prison, Abu Salim. And, uh, uh, they, and they started and they went on the street and, they, and part of it, they were peaceful. But the problem is, how did we reach from the 17th of February in a month's time to accept a no-fly zone over Libya? Mm -hmm. Obviously, yes, there were fabrications and uh, the massacre was one of them. Why? Because the, the first uh, uh, mentioning of the massacre and genocide actually was by the UN uh, representative, uh, Ibrahim Dabash, uh, Dabash in uh, the UN, uh, uh, the Libyan UN representative, who mentioned that Gaddafi was about to slaughter the city of Benghazi and there was going to be a genocide in Libya. Now, this is, uh, uh, you know, as you are very well aware, Strania, on all this, in the sense that uh, we, they want us to make believe that the media and particularly the social media are a democratic space, whereas they can be weaponized at any time, again, you know, for, uh, for the interests of the powerful. And this is what happened in the case of Libya, uh, mm -hmm. because what you had was uh, um, while everybody was calling for uh, uh, soldiers taking Viagra to, to rape right, left and center, 
uh, the massacre and, ben and, ben and the genocide in Benghazi, when, when Robert Gates was asked at the Pentagon press conference if they had any evidence of this, they actually said, yes, we saw reports on the press, but we have no evidence. Then Obama comes and say, we don't want another Rwanda, so we, we need to act, we need to do something. And again, what was amplified were only certain statements. Now, everybody's going to remember Saif al-Islam pointing his finger during his speech, or Gaddafi talking about Zanga Zanga, I'm going uh, in every street by street uh, looking for you. But we're not going to remember the, the, the weeping of uh, Isham al-Shushan. In fact, on February 15th, the so-called rebels captured and killed the black-skinned army lieutenant, Isham al-Shushan, accused of being a mercenary soldiers, soldier working for the regime. And this is, you know, where all the fabrications about the mercenary starts. Basically, you are uh, a black uh, person, you are a mercenary, you are a, a loyalist for the regime. And there were other, men, other, uh, other situations where... Uh, the, the protesters, uh, you know, besieged the army barracks. The, for example, in the, in the airport of Benghazi, they obtained weapons. They set on fire police station and security forces premises. You know, it, it was, uh, there were protests. The government reacted. But uh, the thing is that in one month's time, there was uh, already a NATO operation ongoing. It's, uh, it's self-evident. It was planned. <laughs> um, and then I wanted to, you know, I wanted to ask about this other aspect of Libya that's so important and that's essentially fueling, you know, the destruction of Libya is fueling conflicts in other areas today. You know, thanks to Libya, I think uh, the gun became a livelihood for men throughout Africa. Uh, and they brought this profession to places like Sudan and the Sahel. Can you explain how destroying Libya actually ended up destabilizing much of Africa? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, uh, first and foremost, uh, I mean, we have to go back to to the process of uh, uh, to not to the process to the policies and uh, of African unity that Libya was trying to 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 uh, to, uh, to pursue in the in the during the nineties and the two thousand. This, they are, they're pretty important, you know, because uh, what they tell us is, is the fact that uh, Libya, the, the, there, were, there was no agreement. Africa is a huge continent, so there's no need to glorify or uh, to think that this was going to happen. But there were concrete policies being pursued to actually uh, uh, <clears throat> spearhead, uh, you know, the, the economic and te technological and political capacities of Africa. So in that front, the attack on Libya in 2011 was also an attack on Africa and on a certain vision that Libya was trying to uh, bring forward. Now, what we see is that uh, with the collapse of Libya and uh, the poor, and well, there, is, there have always been uh, porousness of borders, particularly in the south of the country. So what you're seeing is that uh, the West comes in in 2011, starts. Uh, distributing weapons of all kinds to all types of uh, rebel groups, which later on will become militias. And, uh, you know, the gun really becomes, a, it, it becomes a supermarket. You can get arms and these conflicts start to spill over in the Sahel. And what happens when the conflict starts to spill over in the Sahel? That France feels entitled to intervene and to carry out a counter-terror operation. Look at what's happening in Chad right now. Same issue, you know, it's, uh, it's turning more and more, the, it's, it's militarizing more and more the, the area. And this is where I really think that, uh, you know, we need to understand militarism, war as uh, economic cycles, as uh, new modes of capital, in, of economic integration of the global south into the economy. Look at Tunisia, for example. The amount of military aid that it's coming from the U.S. or the construction of borders that we mentioned before, the trainings, the assistance that, it's, uh, that the Tunisia is getting on, uh, on uh, police trainings uh, that Germany is doing, for example, or the U.S., it's just unbelievable. Everybody has a hand on it. And, uh, you know, and I think this is where the real disability... It's, uh, again, 
there is an idea of destabilization, which is true. On the one hand, we need to see this as destabilizing, but at the same time, we need to see this as stabilizing capital. Yeah. And yeah. that's the scary part, you know. And now we have with Ukraine, and like you were mentioning earlier, it's uh, it's to stabilize capital can even mean the potential destruction of the world. I mean, when you see picking a fight yeah. with a nuclear power, and it's it's pretty incredible what these people are willing to take us to. Um, and I guess you know the last thing I want to ask you is you know is today's Libya the legacy of uh, Gaddafi or the legacy of imperialism? which kind of brings us back to what we've been talking about. <laughs> right, right. I think this is where, uh, you know, the, the dialectical method and uh, will bring us back to these questions in the sense that uh, we can't treat one without the other. Uh, and anybody who tries to do that, it's going to end up in a dead hole at the end. And this is a bit why, because uh, any historical formation, uh, any social formation, and their historical development in the periphery needs to be understood vis-a-vis -vis the primary contradiction, which is US-led imperialism. What kind of uh, uh, legacy has Gaddafi left to Libya? Has left uh, a legacy of uh, decolonial struggle in the 70s, which was not anymore the type of struggle in the 2000s. So we really need this kind of gradual analysis to understand how this change took place. And when we do so, we understand that any country in the periphery of the world is going to operate under a structure, an economic and political structure that can be weaponized at any moment to crush them if they dare to challenge it. And that's are the forces of imperialism. So, what we see now is that uh, Libya is not just the legacy, it's not the legacy of Gaddafi. It might be, I might be a bit too dark here, but the future of imperialism as well. Hmm. In the sense that uh, if uh, we continue to see in the policy circle the absence of reflections on our militarism, uh, fossil fuel consumption and uh, military interventions have brought us here, then most likely the Libyan w destruction is just one, it's a war one step closer to the, you know, to these apocalyptic scenarios that climate scientists are telling us are possible. That's a really good point. Cause you know, oftentimes you'll hear people in the West say that like these countries are so backwards, they're all living in the past. But in act, but in actually, like when you look at a lot of these post-war countries or currently in a war countries, it really is like a window into the future in so many ways, on a societal level, on an environmental degradation level. It actually yes. is quite frightening. Um, on that, yes. on that very dark note, <laughs> um, Matteo, I want to thank you so much for your incredible Thanks, work sir. and also for coming on and giving me so much of your time and breaking Thanks, all of this uh, down for us. And I hope that we can have you back on at some time in the future uh, to hear Thanks. from your wonderful analysis. Thank you. Thanks, Rania. It's been my pleasure. I mean, indeed.